It is September 18th, 2022, and you are now watching Real Talk with Ronnie. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the fastest growing political talk show in New Jersey. I'm Ronald Lynn, your host, and here on Real Talk with Ronnie, we only engage in real talk, real news in real time. We are airing on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, and Getter. Additionally, you can catch our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Just search for Real Talk with Ronnie. Pretty soon, we'll also be airing on my new television network, Limbright TV, found exclusively on Roku, the largest streaming service in the world, seen by over 50 million people worldwide. So stay tuned. As always, check out our website at realtalkronnie.com for everything you need to know about our groundbreaking show. Okay, let me start off today's show by saying that I received a huge endorsement this past week from President Donald Trump for my campaign for Bergen County Commissioner. What, you don't believe me? See for yourself. What a tremendous stand. We had the Wood Cliff Lake Republican Party dinner. We're really, it's a great charity event. We're raising money for tremendous candidates. And this is one of my favorites. Ronald Lynn, he's running for Bergen County Commissioner. And Bergen County is one of the most beautiful places in all the United States. We're going to get rid of that evil Governor Murphy. He's horrible. And Ron, I'm telling you, he's really going places. He's doing a great job. And really, what an event tonight at the Wood Cliff Lakes Republican dinner. It really is tremendous. God bless you. And always remember this. Liberalism's a cancer and we are the cure. Okay, so it wasn't the real President Trump, but he was pretty damn good. Tommy is this impersonator's name, and he's been all over the country going to different events, golf outings, parties, concerts. He's been a huge hit. He showed me photos of himself with Don Jr., Kimberly Guilfoyle, and a lot of big names. And you know, I believe he grew up not too far from where the real Trump grew up, and his natural voice actually sounds like that. So who knows, maybe Trump is actually copying him. Anyway, I had a great time meeting Tommy this past week at an event in Woodcliffe Lake. He's a great guy and you never know, perhaps my campaign will get an endorsement from the real deal in the near future. So stay tuned, one can hope, right? All jokes aside though, I urge you all to vote for my team and I on column one on November 8th. Please check out my website winwithlin.us winwithlin.us to learn more about my campaign for Bergen County Commissioner. And if you can, make a contribution. Every dollar counts and I thank you in advance. So every week we'll go through some of the top news around the world, in the country and in our great state. Uh, for this week, first up, this week we saw the passing of a legend. Queen Elizabeth II died at the age of 96, at the tender age of 96 after serving as the longest reigning monarch in UK history, 70 years on the throne. Can you imagine working at the same job for 70 years? Well, Queen Elizabeth II served her subjects with dignity, grace, and courage during her reign. A reign which saw global wars, pandemics, and countless royal controversies. In the end, the queen remained a beloved and well-respected figure in the UK, and she is, of course, now succeeded by her son, King Charles III. God save the queen here on earth and of course in heaven. Earlier this week, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis flew a plane full of migrants to ritzy Martha's Vineyard and they were welcomed with open arms. Well, not exactly. In fact, the country's enclave for privileged and wealthy liberals threw a bit of a tantrum when these 50 migrants arrived at their doorsteps. But wait, isn't the Democratic Party the party of compassion, love and acceptance? Well, apparently, all that free love and no hate mantra goes out the door when the needy arrive at their doors. Hypocrisy at its finest, I must say. Classic liberals. And the uproar isn't just happening in Martha's Vineyard. All across the country and Democratic-run sanctuary cities and states, from Chicago to New York to Washington, D.C., Democratic leaders are beside themselves and calling in the National Guard or calling for a state of emergency. Why don't these liberals ever practice what they preach? Because then they'd be principled. And as we can see time and time again, that is a word that is absent from their lexicon. Just like another famous word, mothers. Right here in the state of New Jersey, our residents are gonna be in for a rude awakening come October 1st. 
On the 1st of October, our natural gas bills are going to be going up, up, up. From New Jersey natural gas to PSENG, all of our gas bills are spiking, with PSENG going up by 25%. So for all the rosy news we hear from the media about how things are getting better, the facts, numbers, and our bank accounts say differently. But actually, this trend has been the norm since Biden took office. Cost of living on every single front and aspect has been on the rise. So remember that harsh reality when you vote this November. All right. On our spectacular show tonight, we welcome the 2022 Republican nominee for Congress from New Jersey's 11th Congressional District, Mr. Paul DeGroote. Paul DeGroote has been a Passaic County prosecutor for most of his career and is a first-time candidate. He beat the odds this past June when he won the Republican primary, and he hopes to beat the odds once again this fall when he takes on Democratic incumbent Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill. Mr. DeGroote was recently added to the NRCC's on the radar list, which means that the National Republicans in Washington, D.C. see his race as a winnable race. Paul is a great friend and has a beautiful family, and we are so excited to have him on our show tonight. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming on to Real Talk with Ronnie, Mr. Paul DeGroote. Hold on, baby. Mr. Paul DeGroote, thank you so much for coming on to Real Talk with Ronnie. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you on. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me. And you're right, it is a pleasure to be here today. All right, so Paul DeGroote, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who is Paul DeGroote? Okay, um, Paul DeGroote, the person, is a very real person with some very real background. And, uh, you know, I was uh, born and raised in this state. Uh, as, uh, you know, with a firefighter father. Uh, my father was a, a career firefighter. That uh, so I was in a blue collar household, a, a union household. Uh, so I was raised with a particular set of values, uh, and that values included helping others, always being looking out for uh, your your friend, your neighbor, uh, and that's how we got our our website, PaulDegroutCares.com. Um, and during the campaign, uh, uh, I put out uh, you know some stories were told about. Uh, you know things that i had done in my life uh you know we had a friend at my very first uh, event talk about uh, how i saved him from uh, when he was drowning uh, up in montauk uh, when he was like 16 years old 17 years old and he told that that a very real story about how he, he you know went down underneath the water gasped the cold salty water and then felt an arm grab him around the chest and uh, and he joked that all of a sudden he heard a voice say stop struggling or we're both gonna drown and you know a story like that that's my life i've always been doing things like that uh i see a problem i act um on you know on 9 11 i volunteered for the red cross to go down to ground zero and deliver supplies um and, I, and in a in a in an event that my father was aghast at was uh, when i chased down a uh a, a mugging uh, suspect in new york city uh he assaulted a cab driver and attempted to get away and i, I ran him down and held him for police uh, so it's kind of just who I embodied myself. Uh, you know, it's uh, my career as a prosecutor. Uh, so I was raised with good values, try to help others, try to, uh, you know, make uh, make the world, make uh, people's lives a better uh, and better. And, uh, you know, I've, I think I've succeeded to a good degree uh, as a prosecutor for 25 years. Love my career, did a lot of good work uh, and helped. Uh, I think I helped a lot of victims. OK. Now, Paul, um, I believe I read somewhere that you're very tall. You're like six six, right? <laughs> Close enough. I'm 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 six four, which is okay. just just over the height where you can buy off the rack shirts, off the rack pants, <laughs> and suits. So right. uh, that's it's costing me a little extra money. <laughs> so at six four, like when you had to save your friend who was drowning, did you even have to go in the water, or did you just reach down and <laughs> and uh, pick so, him up? <laughs> so uh, you know that that was a unique experience in the sense that. Uh, when uh, we were we were swimming in Montauk, and uh, all of a sudden we saw the lifeguards. My, my friend, uh, one of my friends, was a, we were the strongest swimmers in the group, and we saw the lifeguards going into action, and we, right. we were wondering what was happening. And then we we saw my friend Ken being pulled out toward the, uh, I guess, toward uh, Great Britain or England uh, from Montauk, and he was bobbing like a cork, in his words, and. Uh, you know, just was by the luck of day, I made the, by luck got to him and was able to help. Uh, you know, and you know, and that words when he said uh, when uh, you know I, I I told him I still remember that, but when uh, he said uh, you know stop, I told him stop struggling, we're both gonna drown, and, and <laughs> he relaxed. And but that was a uh, you know that's kind of it's 
I don't know if it's startup, but I've always been that way. Always, okay. always been seeing a problem, and uh, and kind of that's reason why I got in this race. I see a problem with the with what's happening in America, and uh, I said, you know, I have to try. Um, so you're a problem solver and you are a doer, right? So um, let's walk us back uh, about your uh, you know, career. So you mentioned that you were a prosecutor, right? Uh, do, you, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Like, what did you do prior to uh, being a prosecutor? Well, you know, uh, so went to uh, went to law school and graduated law school. And, um, you know, I, I had that grand life ambition uh, that I would try something different. So I was out and actually camped cross country for eight weeks uh, and uh, settled in California for about a year and a half. So I got to see America. I, I, and uh, and when I came back to Jersey about a year and a half later, um, you know, I had tried a few things. Uh, you know, I wanted to be see if there, you know, the break out and try something different. Uh, I was born and raised in New Jersey my entire life. Um, and when I came back, I also camped out uh, and saw the rest of America. And I, I tell you, I learned a lot. Um, you know, it wasn't hotels. It was you know in a tent. And I, I saw middle America. I saw that, uh, you know, America is not just the East Coast and the West Coast. There's a lot of good people in the middle. And uh, we represent a diverse, diverse uh, community. We represent a diverse nation. And I think CD11, you know, is kind of representative of what I saw across the nation. Um, but I was, uh, I did private practice for a short time. And then uh, one day my father and I were talking on the back deck. And uh, he said, uh, he said, do you like being doing the law work you do? And I was doing insurance defense and plaintiff's work. And, you know, I said to him, no, I can't believe I went through seven years of schooling not to enjoy what I'm doing. And uh, my father, whose advice maybe I didn't take as a, as a child, I certainly, uh, as a young adult and as an adult, I consult my dad on everything. And, uh, and I respect his opinion because as, as young people, you should respect your parents' opinion because they've been through it before. And he suggested, you know, you should try to you know, apply to the prosecutor's office. You've always been someone who liked playing by the rules. You uh, were always against people that cheated in the games. And, uh, and you are always, you're always conservative and you were always raised in a, a firefighter household and your, your uncle was a police officer. My father's friends were firemen and it just kind of rang a bell. And I applied and applied and applied and interviewed and I just didn't give up. And uh, I finally, after about you know 10 phone calls and meeting people and sending in resumes, while also working in law, I continued to practice law, I came back uh, the second interview, a better candidate. I made myself a better candidate. I had practical experience and I got the job. And uh, I got the job I really wanted, which was trial attorney. Um, I was, you know, there was a chance I would be an appellate uh, but I didn't want it. I wanted to be in the courtroom. I wanted to be trying a case. I wanted to be working with victims. I wanted to be in front of a jury. Right. Okay. So uh, you got it on your second attempt? On my second attempt. The first uh, first interview, uh, no success. Uh, and I had to wait, uh, I guess it was about a year um, okay. before before that, that took. Um, so uh, uh, and in 1994, I was working on a political campaign, the Contract of America year. Uh, so oh, right. We were work, worked on a good campaign. I was back in Jersey by that point, and then I got hired in 1996. Okay. Um, so, uh, and the career has been the career was wonderful, uh, from AP to senior AP to chief AP. And you were a prosecutor for how long? 25 years. 25 years. Wow. Okay. So you spoke of 1994. It was the year in which Republicans uh, overwhelmingly took over the House, right? Correct. Uh, um, a lot of analysts and political pundits are saying that 2022 is going to be like a 1994. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I look at it at two ends. Um, one, uh, what's happening nationwide and uh, that this is a good year for Republicans. But I also look at it from CD11's point of view. Uh, that's the district I'm in. And we can't just as as people that want good government, lower taxes, cut in, uh, cuts in spending, are pro law enforcement, pro border security, pro military, uh, and you know, in general, just anti wokeness with what's going on in the country. Uh, you know, we can't just rely on Republicans coming out. Uh, my campaign, especially, we're reaching out to everybody that we can possibly meet, uh, groups that have been overlooked. Uh, and uh, for too, far too long, groups that have been overlooked. And we are doing community outreach and we are meeting new people. 
And I think my my message, uh, you know, I, I like to say, you know, I'm a Republican, but I'm running my race in CD11. I'm not running in Texas. I'm not running in Oklahoma, uh, you know, uh, Florida. CD11 is a diverse community with diverse um, ideas and values. And I'm going to represent all of CD11. I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not going to say that uh, um, I'm not going to I'm going to do the actual work to represent CD11. I don't want to be governor. I just want to be the best congressman I could possibly be. Okay. Now, is this your first run for uh, public office? Yes, it is, and it, it, and it's an amazing run. It's a uh, you know. Uh, yeah, let's uh, talk a little bit about that run, right? Because I mean, you went through a bit of a primary process, right? That was at times kind of uh, you know hectic, right? Because I guess uh, there was another individual, I believe, the county commissioner, the current commissioner, right, of uh, Morris County, right. Uh, that Tafin Salen, right? Correct. He was supposedly the uh, front runner, right? Since he got the uh, line, I believe, in uh, which county? In like Passaic County, right? No, I, um, and he got the, so the district, the way it's broken up um, briefly is the majority of the district is Morris County. The second largest is Essex County. And then third is Passaic County. Okay. So Typhoon, um, he, he got the um, uh, Morris County line and the Essex right. County line. And I got the Passaic County line. Uh, I, I was born and raised there. My, right. my parents grew up there and I practiced law there. So I was very proud that Chairman Murphy uh, uh, and, and the uh, people that voted for me to get that line, uh, you know, to get my hometown, help my home, uh, my home uh, county. Right. But I, was, I lived up in Morris County for about 11 years now. So I'm not really the Passaic County guy anymore. I'm right. really kind of the CD11 guy now. Right. But you're right. It was a it was a contentious primary. A lot of people were testing the waters or actually in the race. I think if I count it right, the way I just said it, 11 people were testing the waters or actually in the race. Right. And um, so you got the Passaic County line. And I think, I mean, you ended up winning the nomination because you overwhelmingly carried Passaic County. It was by like a, a crazy margin, by, by, by like 70%, right? And that's correct. When you, uh, you probably know, when you run off the line, you right. lose about 20% of your chance to get elected. And so I, in two counties, I went, I ran off the line. Um, and I said to my wife, when we got back into, after the county convention, when we got back into the car, um, there might've been a little, a tiny bit of profanity, but I, I said, <laughs> I'm going to the primary. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make the, let the voters decide. Uh, I think my message on law enforcement is strong and my American first type of ideas. But I also think that, um, you know, I'm exactly the candidate that can win CD11 because I'm not an extremist. Uh, I'm not, I'm not so... Uh, I, I listen, I negotiate, I've worked out thousands of cases and that night the vote came in. You're actually, you're right. We kept it tight in Morris County. I was down by about a thousand votes. We were kept it extremely tight in Essex County. And then Passaic County came through and, uh, brought me over the top. So, uh, but nothing was left for granted. You're talking to a candidate that was putting up his own signs, uh, the night before the election, trying to get every last vote out of the district right now um how were you able to win Passaic county by such a large margin though did your opponents not campaign there or did you just campaign extra hard i, I think both are the right answer um you know Passaic county has four towns it's the smallest part of the district um so the the numbers clearly if you win morris county uh, by a large number you're likely going to win. And if you're not going to win it by a large number, maybe you can win Essex County by a, a similarly not large number. Um, and my opponent, uh, he did. He, he won uh, Morris County. He won Essex County. It's just that, you know, my uh, my work in Passaic County, Essex County, and Morris County, I kept right. it close, close. And then in Passaic County, I made sure nothing was left to, to chance and as I said, I, I, I thank the uh, I thank par, uh, party chairman uh, Peter Murphy for doing a wonderful job supporting me and always being there to uh, to you know be uh, to give me advice. Right. Okay. Now, uh, since the primary, um, have you and your opponents you know come come together and uh, you know kind of like you know made up? <laughs> Oh, good. Great question. And yes, we have. Uh, so uh, uh, Typhoon was one of the first people to congratulate me. And also, uh, um, you know, uh, Toby Anderson was in the race, a, a very, uh, a very a great guy, uh, a patriot, um, two term Iraq veteran. And, uh, you know, having their having their congratulations 
and unifying the party is what's important now. Uh, we, you, know, you run a tough primary and uh, you know things happen, but in the end, there is one focus and it's bringing back the best government to see the 11 you can possibly find. And right now, I think we can do, we can do better. I know we can do better than what's going, going on in the country right now. Okay, now speaking of uh, you know CD11, are there any issues that are specific to uh, you know that to uh, that district CD11? Okay, um, well there are, there are a few. Yes, um, so you know you look at first of all, uh, everybody was affected by COVID, um, right. and one of the things that uh, uh, in CD11, so other congressmen, um, you know, they were short on the census, but they seem to have gotten more COVID funding. Um, my opponent, Mikey Sherrill, we were short on the census in Morris County and we got nothing extra. Uh, so, you know, that's a lack of work ethic and uh, you will not get that lack of work ethic uh, from me. I will work hard to do everything I can for the district. So that's an example. Um, the other example is Picatinny Arsenal. Picatinny Arsenal is our largest uh, employer. And um, Mikey Sherrill recently, and I think you could find it, um, she made a comment. Oh, Picatinny Arsenal, they uh, they manufacture uh, weapons. That's ridiculous. They don't manufacture weapons. They test weapons. Um, so she doesn't even know the uh, the, the arsenal and the, and the uh, district. Um, but in the, it also in CD11, um, dredging um, and, and uh, snagging, clearing the waterways. We have a flooding problem in this area. And, uh, you know, there's talk of a big game of, you know, bringing more dredging and bringing more uh, flood prevention. And it's not happened yet. It's two months before the election and money has been promised and no money or funding has come through. I know the dredging. I know the, the snagging effort because I live here. I live in Morris County um, and I, I've seen it and the water, you know, the roads are underwater. But finally, um, Mikey Sherrill campaigned on salt relief. Uh, uh, state and local taxes. In 2018, uh, um, the policies of Trump, the Republicans, they capped salt at $10,000. And, you know, I'm not in favor of the federal government paying New Jersey's tax bills. Uh, New Jersey is the most highly taxed state in the nation. And I don't think the federal government should be paying our taxes. We should be, you know, unscrewing ourselves and getting our tax uh, nightmare in order. But, the, you know, but that that's a different story with Governor Murphy and the Assembly and the Senate being controlled by one party. But it's similar to what we have now. The president, the Senate and the, and the Congress are all controlled by one party. And Mikey Sherrill said, I'm going to get you your salt relief back in 2018. She said it in 2020. And then when she had a chance to stand up like, uh, you know, like Joe Manchin stood up for his state, she had a chance to stand up and say, no, I'm not signing the Inflation Reduction Act, which, yeah, you can name something, anything. It doesn't mean it's going to. The inflation is going to go up uh, because of the mad spending. That inflation, you know, that the old saying, you can put lipstick on a pig. Uh, that Inflation Reduction Act, no matter what you call it, is still a terrible piece of legislation. Um, Mikey Sherrill had a chance to stand up, stand with the voters of New Jersey, stand with the voters of CD11 and get us salt relief, or at least say, I'm standing here and no one's backing me off it. What she did, she caved, she folded, she threw in the cards, and that's just done to please her boss, which is Nancy Pelosi and the Biden administration. Um, she'll do anything. She votes 99% of the time with her, and she really doesn't care about the salt relief because her bigger ambition is to be governor of the state. And I'd like to see her deny it. Uh, right. That's what she wants to be. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people in, in the state that are saying that are claiming that Mikey Sherrill is like the next big thing, right? That perhaps she's going to run for governor in 2025. So aside from the whole salt issue, right? What do you see are some of her other you know, weaknesses? Oh, the weakness is clearly law enforcement. Um, you know, again, uh, you know, one year as a federal prosecutor thereabouts. I don't think she tried a case. I don't think she met with a grieving victim uh, of a, a 14 year old girl who was shot. I have, I don't think she never did wiretaps. She never did the hard work, met with detectives to do an investigation. Um, I have done some heavy, heavy work in Patterson in Pasay County when I was, when I was there. Uh, it's the top 100 most dangerous cities. I had 4.30 in the morning phone calls, law enforcement. She fails on law enforcement. In her own bio, she says, 
uh, oh, I, I wanted to be part of criminal justice reform. That's why I became a federal prosecutor. Uh, come on, you know, who goes into federal prosecuting uh, uh, wanting to do criminal justice reform? If I got that job, I'd want to take on terrorism. I'd want to fight the mob. Uh, that's, you know, that's just such, uh, uh, you know, a ridiculous comment. Um, and you know what? She, I think she was there for a year. It's a resume builder. You know, I don't have a resume builder. I have a resume, 25 right. years of, of fighting for victims. Um, and uh, no matter how much uh, anybody tried to take that away, they can't. I did the real work. I did about 100 trials. So law enforcement, we have a rash of car thefts. And I'm, I'm sure, Ronnie, where you live, car thefts. It's in the Burden County also, right? Yep. It's all over New Jersey. <laughs> and that's the crime wave that is hitting suburbia. Uh, maybe our murder rate in, in Morris County is not going up, but our crime, our thefts, our burglaries, ho breaking into homes in broad daylight, uh, that's happening. So, you know, where's the money for the plate readers? Where's the money for more police? Where's the grant money? Um, right. Mikey Sherrill's not talking about crime, and she's not talking about the, the southern border problem either. I mean, uh, you know, speaking of crime, I, I had a fundraiser, right? And I think you were there, right? And thank you yes, for uh, you know, coming. And at my fundraiser, Billy Prempe, who's also running for Congress from CD9, right? He mentioned that his car was actually stolen when he parked it in, I think it was uh, New York City, right? So yes, the problem of crime is not just in Jersey. It's all over the country. And I think part of the reason crime is on the rise is because democratic policies have made it possible for criminals, right? Or those who would want to be criminals to feel like they can get away with it. You're, you're absolutely on point. The, there is right now, I think in New Jersey, I just read that there is pr proposed legislation about upping shoplifting to a felony because of these smash and grab mobs that just run in, grab all the clothes and grab all the jewelry and then run out uh, in the mall. So they're, they're, they're considering raising um, you know, shoplifting to a felony. That's the first time I, I've prosecuted both and uh, I think that the, the both the Democrats and the Republicans, in some form, they've agreed that this is a problem that uh, they've identified in the assembly of New Jersey. And we've got to help the store owner. Uh, there's been some horrendous abuse of, uh, of Indian store owners uh, in Edison that robbed in broad daylight. Um, another thing is what we've what I've seen. Mikey Sherrill hasn't because, you know, quite frankly, I don't know if she'd know how to identify a, a criminal case. Um, what I've seen is. There are, and I've talked to the police chiefs in our district, uh, that they are using packs and young uh, packs of juveniles to steal the cars because they the the adult criminals drive the juveniles into the neighborhoods to steal the cars, knowing if the juvenile gets caught, there is no chance they are going to be detained. They will be released immediately to their their parent or released. Whereas if the adult is caught stealing the car, they will be um, they may be detained. Um, so that is an inter interesting development about how the criminals are adapting and becoming smarter. Yeah. Bail reform has been uh, bail reform uh, is what New Jersey calls it. Criminal justice, re criminal justice reform is what Mikey Sherrill calls it. Great, right. Mikey, you're freeing them. I'm putting bad people away. Right. And quite frankly, I think at this point, the criminals are actually smarter than the uh, politicians, right? <laughs> it seems so. It seems so. Right. There's a lot of frustration on law enforcement's part. Yeah. Now, so Paul, um, you know, the Democrats, I can see that they are trying to pivot the issue for 2022 to reproductive rights of women. Right. Because they've seen that this is potentially a winning issue. Um, I believe there was a special race for Congress up in New York State, right, where the Democrat narrowly won because of this issue. Um, this issue is actually a non-issue in Jersey since uh, reproductive rights is actually codified into our uh, legal system. And if you're a woman, you can uh, get access to an abortion up until the uh, time of birth, right? But nevertheless, Democrats are still going to use this issue and especially someone like, you know, Mikey Sherrill, right? She's going to keep hammering this, right? So what is your response to attacks that she might level at you in regards to this issue? Great question. Um, so here, you, you nailed it. Um, Mikey Sherrill is falling into the, the typical Democratic plan uh, of scare. Um, New Jersey, you are absolutely 100% correct. And people have to understand this and they have to realize this. Um, the recent decision by the Supreme Court has now made it a state's rights issue. 
This needs to be talked about. Mikey Sherrill and her party have already slammed me three times on something and, and on that issue. And first of all, they don't know me. Uh, they don't know my uh, you know, my positions. Uh, they've called me a far right extremist, which I, I find is kind of humorous because during the primary, some of my own party were calling me a rhino. Uh, so a Republican in name only. So where am I? Am I too moderate, too liberal, or am I too extreme? But Mikey Sherrill, is, she knows as well as anybody, and she should, because she's a federal prosecutor. She knows the law. New Jersey has codified it. It is the law. There is no, uh, nothing has changed in New Jersey. New Jersey, you have the right to an abortion in the first month, all the way through the ninth month. And a congressman does not have any say on this issue in New Jersey. It's left now to the people of the state of New Jersey, the judges of the state of New Jersey, the assemblymen, and uh, the governor. Uh, so that, that's where it is lied. She's weaponized it. She's trying to scare these people. She's trying to scare women. You know what? I ask people, you want to know my public policy? Come, talk to me, meet with me. I have I have young children. I have a daughter that uh, I, you know, I have a two-year-old daughter. I'm married to a, a wonderful mom and a wife. I have always advocated for women's rights. I've always said that women should have equal pay, better opportunities. Um, and I, and again, my life is full of stories. My wife went through um, sexual harassment on her job. And, you know, we made sure that she was protected and uh, and that we, we, we righted her wrong. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. I am not anti-women, I am pro-women. And New Jersey has this law. And as a prosecutor, I respect and honor the constitution of our America. And I respect and honor the constitution of New Jersey. Um, so that is the that is the rule that is the law new jersey has that right it is it might be different than indiana but you know what i'm not running for cd11 in indiana i'm running right. for cd11 in new jersey i respect the laws in new jersey and uh it's up to the voters in new jersey and the governor and the courts to decide if, if changes are made um right. so stop lying about my record mikey and stop lying just to gain your vote debate me Come out and debate me more than the one time that you said that you may debate me on October 28th after the mail-in votes have already started piling in. Debate me in September. Debate me again in mid-September. One debate in all three counties. What are you afraid of, Mikey Sherrill? Now, this supposed uh, debate, is it going to be virtual or uh, uh, in person? I'm sure if she had it her way, it would be uh, virtual. I want it in person. Uh, I want it in person and uh, I want three debates. Let's really, let's her and I, um, I respect her. Um, she, she's a, you know, a, a formidable opponent. Let's have a person to person debate on these issues. Let's televise it. And, uh, and you know, Ron, you know, why don't you be one of the moderators? Why sure. don't you, you know, let's I'll be honored. <laughs> come, come. And uh, that would be fantastic. We need fair moderators. Uh, the League of Women's Voters was the option that was given to us. Um, you know, their reputation is uh, not the best with the GOP. Um, and uh, when asked about uh, what is the name of the moderators, they even struggled to uh, give us that. They said, we train all our moderators to be fair. Uh, eventually, they gave us our, their, their names. But quite frankly, I want a different moderator for one, one debate, a different moderator for a second debate. And then I'll accept the League of Women's Voters for the third debate. Um, but let's be real. We need three. This is a this is the country that we're caring about. We need more debates. And Mikey Sherrill, you've been you've been in office for four years now. You've debated two other candidates. Uh, you've given them more than one debate. So uh, come on, let's let's be real. Uh, there you go. I'm a I'm a little county prosecutor. Uh, what are you afraid of? Right. So uh, you know, gloves are off, right? <laughs> That's that's the thing you know uh i think uh you know i think it'll be a, a interesting debate of values and 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 policies um and uh you know some of the things i've campaigned on in the uh, uh medic the expansion of medicare i've talked about that uh and uh wow radical idea for a republican not so much if you cut enough useless ridiculous spending we cut enough spending i'm not saying expand medicare spending i'm saying expand medicare cut enough spe useless federal uh, spending cut it streamline it and maybe my 87 year old father and my 92 year old uncle can have vision dental and hearing covered by medicare instead of separate little part a part b part c 
Uh, and let's get better care for our veterans. We cut ridiculous spending and we'll have better care for our veterans as well. Now, uh, that might, I don't think that's a, a, a Republican idea. I don't think it's a Democrat idea. I think that's a real human type of thing. We treat our seniors better. It kind of represents who we are as Americans. Right. And especially our, uh, our you know, veterans, right? And I do um, know that there's a lot, of, a lot of government waste on the federal level. And there's no reason why we can't get a, get a lot of these programs in if we just streamlined the process and uh, used the money more efficiently, right? <laughs> Uh, absolutely. You know, uh, coming from coming from government, um, I was there for 25 years. And I will say from practical experience, no government agency that I saw ever wants to be going down. You give them $100, they'll spend $100. You give them $100,000, they'll spend $100,000. It is the very nature of government to grow, to grow and grow. Um, so uh, I've worked with so many different agencies um, uh, in my job, state, local, federal, FBI, DEA. Um, and I and, you know, through all that, I have always seen uh, I get the A, I get the job done and B, every um, budgets always grow. Government always wants more and we need to streamline government to make it more effective. Um, so that's what that would be my argument uh, and cut the wasteful cut the wasteful spending there have been some um unbelievable studies uh one of the studies that i campaigned on was uh there was a study on the effects of alcohol and admission into the er wow you know that's that's amazing do we need to study that because i think the common sense is uh, you know right there in front of you you know alcohol is going to lead to more admissions into the er uh, you know, there are there are better things that we can be uh, putting our efforts and focus to. For instance, um, gun violence. Let's talk about gun violence, um, Ronnie. Um, I am I'm in favor of uh, a study on gun violence. I think that would be for what's happening across our nation. I do not want to see another Uvalde. I do not want to see another child killed by guns. I had to live it as my, in my job. I saw a 14 year old girl. Mur I, I had a 14 year old girl murdered. The case I had tragedy um, and, you know, youth in the inner city is, is comes cheap sometimes. Uh, I'm for, you know, I'm for red flag laws. Mikey Sherrill, you never dealt with a red flag law. You never dealt, you never took a gun off the street and you never took drugs off the street, which is one of the prime uh, movers of violence, uh, drug crime. So um, I've taken guns off the street, drugs off the street. Uh, I'm in favor of the red flag laws because I saw them actually work in my in my district. Uh, they weren't abused. They, they could be abused by other people, but I saw it used minimally in uh, in my district of Pasig County Prosecutor's Office, and um, I saw it work. So uh, uh, that, uh, so I, I believe also in a very uh, uh, a enhanced uh, background check. Um, I, so uh, I'm in favor of background investigations. So gun violence, um, I, I want to be the solution to this right. problem. And who better than somebody that has experience in it? Yeah. All right. Now, Paul, um, can you tell us something uh, fun about Paul DeGroote? What is one fun fact? What does Paul DeGroote do for fun when, when he's not campaigning? Well, all right. So uh, what does Paul DeGroote do for fun when he's not campaigning? Well, I can tell you a fun fact that uh, I'm an older dad. Um, so uh, I became a, a, a married and I became a father later in life. Um, so I think I talked about my career with 25 years in office and I retired. Um, so uh, you in the audience, you can do the math. <laughs> but my my fun fact right now is uh, is being with my children as much as possible. My son is four and a half. Uh, he was our firstborn. My daughter is uh, two. Uh, so Alexander and Jordan. And my fun fact uh, is uh, I just I, I think being an older dad, you really, um, you have a certain perspective of being a younger dad. I'm more more secure, I'm more stable, and I just love watching them grow up. The funny things they say, the funny things they do, and I and I like and I I'm going to try to teach my son and my daughter the same values that my father taught me. I'm going to try to be involved in, in as much as they, my father taught uh, right. was. My father is 87. Right. And uh, I do not miss an opportunity to have the grandchildren visit him. And I had a great childhood and I remember a lot of things. I want to put that onto my my children. So my fun, my fun fact is I'm enjoying my second childhood through my children. That's that's wonderful. And, you know, my, my son is also two years old. So maybe at some point we can set up a uh, play date. <laughs> that's that'd be great. All right.
All right. <laughs> now you you mentioned that your dad um, that you listen to your dad right because he's got words of wisdom right. Do you still consult with with your dad when it comes to your uh, campaign? Uh, you know what? Yeah, I, I, I talk to him very frequently. Um, he's uh, in South Jersey in a, in a retired community. Uh, I said he's 87, still drives a car uh, and uh, and has a girlfriend um, that yeah. he, so <laughs> comes up and visits uh, up in North Jersey. So I, I still talk to him about um, uh, things that go on in the campaign. And uh, although you know, we, now we, none of us have, we, none of us in the family have ever run for office before. So this right. is new. But he listens and he gives practical, I say, um, experience uh, about uh, you know. Uh, sometimes they'll say, you know, stop, don't bother. That you're you're going to be wasting your time. You will never get that person to listen to you. Right. Uh, and yeah, that and you know, I and I shake my head and I agree. And I, you know, my dad's advice is still practical to this day. I wish I would have started listening to him when I was 16. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what if your dad um does at one point at some point have another child right your potential brother or sister might be the same age as your kids right <laughs> <laughs> now that's yeah that's okay there now we're going into the uh the question of you know the uh the, the law school question of the octogenarian right uh, yeah yeah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right paul I'm going to give you the next 30 seconds to give your best pitch to the people of CD11 as to why they ought to vote for Paul DeGroote for Congress on November 8th. Okay, so um, first, my website is pauldegroupcares.com. Um, I got into this race because I saw problems across the country that needed fixing. We have, I, I'm not going to tell you what's wrong. I'm going to tell you what I want and what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut spending and get inflation under control. Seniors cannot survive on 9% inflation on a fixed income. Um, I'm going to already told you about gun violence and how I'm going to solve gun violence and help uh, uh, you know, make sure that there is no massacres and tragedies, enhancing the school security, red flag laws, uh, background investigations. Um, I have a lot of great ideas. I have a lot of energy. I'm from New Jersey. I'm a Jersey guy. Uh, I was raised in, in here my entire life except for when I went to the one year away. I know Jersey problems. Uh, it, it's traffic, it's taxes, it's getting getting things done, it's bridges and roads. Uh, I'm a different type of Republican. I think I told you about the Medicare issue and the gun laws. Uh, I'm, I might be a moderate Republican, but I'm best, I'm best suited to represent this district because I care about it. I was born and raised here, I lived here. Who else would you want better than someone who has small children that are raised that I want to send them to public schools? I went to public schools, wonderful education. My teachers are fantastic, and I want my children to go to public schools as well. Um, so it's very important that I, that I represent this district because I think I bring the values that this district has always had: hard work, tolerance, respect, uh, and a dedication to making things better um, in this district. So you know, please consider me in, in November. You're going to get someone who's real, who's sincere, and I think you're going to be proud of the person you send to the Congress. And that person should be and will be me. All right. Thank you, Paul DeGroote. I'm throwing up your website here. So for anyone who wants to go and check out your platform and if they want to reach out, right, www.pauldegroutecares.com. Thank you, Paul, for coming on. And let's set up that play date, really. <laughs> All right. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Ronnie. Uh, yes, let's do that. And we'd love to you know, have a little barbecue as well. Sure. All right. Thank you, Paul. And best of luck on, on your campaign. I'm sure I'll be seeing you on the campaign trail. All right. Thanks, Ronnie. Thank Take you. care. Bye. Hold